Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. Also by Dan Andriaco's Death Mask, the new book in the Sebastian McCabe Jeff Cody series. And the Baker Street Journal the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. I hear of Sherlock everywhere. Episode 152, Holmes and Watson. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I hear of Sherlock everywhere. A podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Right. Welcome. Welcome back, one and all, to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. Yes, you are, and I'm Bert Wold. Oh, I almost forgot for a second. Where am I? Who Who am I? Why am I here? Almost Stockdalian of me. Now, that we're dating ourselves with that reference. Admiral yeah, Stockton. I remember President Truman spoke about that on one of his radio broadcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Give him hell, Bert. That's what I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're delighted you could join us here for our 152nd episode. We keep barreling on despite common sense to quit. I don't know how we do it. Uh, but this is 152, so that means the... Uh, show notes can be found at ihose.co slash ihose152, all lowercase. And you can find us online at ihearofsherlock.com, on all of the social networks at ihearofsherlock. And, of course, if you'd like to email us any of your thoughts, uh, and if you'd like to uh, participate in the contest we've got later on in the show, uh, you can reach us at comment at ihearofsherlock.com. Dot com. We'd also like to remind you that we benefit from you participating. Uh, that means by uh, certainly uh, jumping in and commenting, that's fine, but also by your leaving us a rating or review, preferably on iTunes. It helps other people find the show, and you can let them know why it is that you've decided to dedicate an hour of your life every other week to this kind of silliness. And uh, no judgment, no judgment whatsoever. We appreciate it. And um, we appreciate you taking the time. Also, just a reminder that if you do tune in later in the show, we do have a special announcement during the Canonical Couplets quiz. This is an opportunity for you to play along and win a prize. want to make sure that you don't miss our special announcement. And of course, I can't wait to hear what it is. What's that? I can't wait to hear what it is. Ha! Neither can I. I'm on the edge of my seat. Let me seat. run. Hold on. Let me just run the tape forward and find out. <laughs> oh, that was interesting. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure everyone else is uh, just about ready to do the same. In the meantime, before you hit that fast forward button, take a listen to this. In the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we're looking forward to the 29th of September and Michaelmas, when the harvest will be over and we hold our hiring fairs, because we're still coping with the labor shortage from the Black Death. 
But you don't need to pay high wages to your field workers because they want to read your copy of One Fixed Point in a Changing Age, a new generation on Sherlock Holmes from our Wessex Press. These essays by a new generation of enthusiasts, many of whom are young or female or both, embrace modern-day revelations of Sherlock Holmes with an introduction by Laurie R. King. Departing summer hath assumed an aspect, tenderly illumined, the gentlest look of spring that calls from yonder leafy shade a timely caroling. As the season shifts, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press provides. Choose yours today. It's always lovely there in the land of Wessex. So bucolic. So bucolic. So many bunions, you know, so much strain in that simple bucolic country farming life. I think a good thing to do would be to have the... um, you know, the moisturizer concession that uh, the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex or the liniment concession would probably be even better. Liniment. We need more liniments. And everything must be scented lavender. Oh, yeah. I like that. Well, our next guest is an absolute treat. We hope that you will enjoy what he has to say. In this episode, we are delighted to welcome Lee Eric Shackelford to the program. Lee is a writer for stage, screen, and radio, a longtime Sherlockian. He teaches playwriting, screenwriting, and script analysis at the University of Alabama Birmingham's theater department. He has written for shows like, oh, Herlock, and uh, has a wonderful fixation and interest in Star Trek and War of the Worlds and H.G. Wells and the Golden Age of Radio and so many other things. We will touch on as many as we can get to in the next hour. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, guys. It's a, it's long been a dream of mine to be on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. <laughs> well, let's, let's you're get... laughing. It, it, you, 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 you're the, you're the Rolls Royce of uh, Sherlockian podcasts. Oh, well, you need to dream bigger. Um, okay. I, and I want to, I want to go there. Uh, first, reach for the stars. Get this out of the way. You, you have your own podcast, right? I got a bunch of them. Oh, tell I'm us a, about that. The podcasting fool. Um, well, I had my, my radio drama serial relativity. So, um, because that's distributed as a podcast, you, you find it on at the website relativitypodcast.com. Uh, because I rather uh, naively chose uh, the name for the show that is defies Google, right? If you start searching for relativity, you'll never get to the radio show. So this is we'll, we'll talk about this later, I'm sure. But this is something I've done repeatedly in my I, in my writing career. I have a theory about that podcast. You <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so did I. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I, I'm also one of the co-hosts of a. Uh, of a, a, a Doctor Who uh, discussion uh, forum called, logically enough, Discussing Who. So and we do those every week. Hmm. So, so yeah, sitting in front of the microphone has become a, a thing that I do. Excellent. Well, we're, we're Just, grateful you. that you're on the other side of the microphone this time around. Thank you. Well, why don't we traipse all the way back to the beginning, as we do with all of our guests, and find out exactly how you came to first encounter this guy known as Sherlock Holmes. It all started in a 5,000 watt station in Fresno, California. Now, um, that's a Mary Tyler Moore joke for people of a certain generation. Um, yeah, my father I, told me about Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's like Sir Arthur saying that uh, men who told him that they, they enjoyed reading, Sherlock Holmes, when they were boys, they don't always get the uh, reception they, think, <laughs> um, they would expect. Yeah, I, I, I almost blush to admit it, but but it was um, it was um, a woman in green. I, I was uh, yeah. flipping channels one afternoon, and I saw Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes being hypnotized, and they were going to walk him off the top of the building. And I was I was hypnotized. And, you know, looking back, I think that's a weird place to, to, to get introduced to Sherlock Holmes. I guess I had been, um, 
aware, you know, just general cultural literacy. But uh, uh, I was, you know, still, I, I, this would have been when I was in middle school. So it wasn't until high school when we were all made to read. Um, um, I, I started to say the Red Headed League, but that's, that's not right. What were we required to read? Uh, Speckled Band. Ah, of course. And yeah, yeah, that was in our, that was in our ninth grade literature books. And I think, you know, that was, you know, yeah, I turned the last page of that and said, well, I hope there's more. <laughs> <laughs> there's more. There is plenty more. And, and you've managed to create more, uh, along the way as well. So when, when did you first start discovering that there were outlets for, um, you know, th- those of us with a, uh, a creative bent? Oh, I, that would have to be the seven percent solution. Hmm. Um, somebody uh, who knew that I was uh, a, a fan of the uh, the original sixty stories gave me a copy of the novel in high school, and I had not heard about it. I didn't know anything about it, and they just said, "Here, I thought you would like it." And I thought, "Well, that's odd. This is a Sherlock Holmes story, but it's not written by Arthur Conan Doyle." And uh, so um, I came along at just the right time, and. Um, it, 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 the book had been around for a while because the very next thing I knew, the movie was in the theaters. And so I, I, right. I begged, uh, my parents uh, to take me to see that. And at the time, as a young man, my three favorite things in the world were Sherlock Holmes, steam locomotives, and sword fights. <laughs> so well, there you imagine, go. yeah, imagine how I felt about that movie. So, um, it was a great picture. It was a real event for people when that came out. And it's interesting, too, because, um, you know, Nick Meyer, it, it, it's interesting the commonality among all of us, these things that we seem to be interested in, because Nick Meyer, of course, had a very uh, deep connection, still does, to Star Trek. Absolutely. And that's also one of your interests, too. Absolutely, and one of mine. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's because of um, a lot of people felt like um, Sherlockian fandom was on the wane until 7% solution kind of um uh, brought people so who kind of brought it back to the, the 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 mainstream four i guess and then um a lot of people said that um star trek the motion picture w- was going to finish star trek once and for all because it just you know that people had their own negative feelings about that uh, even i had to kind of make myself like it back in 1979 and um and then he made the wrath of khan which, holy smoke, you know, that I think everything else that uh, has happened with Star Trek since then devolves from the success of Wrath of Khan. Hmm. So he's the rescuer of franchises, is Nick Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, any Guardian. anyone out there with a failing franchise, just get in touch yeah. with uh, Nicholas no, Meyer. No. Uh, and of course, now Lee, you have the honor of inhabiting the uh, the same airwaves, the same podcast as Nick Meyer, who was uh, on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere back on uh, I think it was episode eighty five. Probably the single episode I've lis- re listened to the most often. Wow! And that's our yeah. that is our record longest episode. So kudos to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It it does uh, it requires a commitment. Uh, <laughs> but he's but he but he is he's a fascinating person, and and you don't have to goad him into talking. So. Oh, oh no! Oh no! You do not. No. Um, well, we want to we want to keep talking to you here. So um, let's get up to. Uh, to Holmes and Watson, this is, um, you know, I, I, I found it astonishing in checking your bio that, uh, and, and I think you are astonished too, that you have produced, uh, more than 200 scripts for stage, screen, and radio. And your best known work, of course, continues to be Holmes and Watson, which originally was presented at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, May 2nd through 6th, 1989, and became uh, the winner of the Ruby Lloyd Aspie National Play Search. And then later on, the very next year, there was an off-Broadway uh, version that opened at Theater at St. Peter's on January 4th, 1990. And uh, in in that case, you played Sherlock Holmes yourself. Did so indeed. tell us a little bit about the evolution, the, the, you know, the, the initial... Um, spark of an idea for Holmes and Watson and how you decided to approach these two characters 
in a fundamentally different and personal way? <laughs> I'm not sure it's fundamentally different, but oh, how much time you got? Um, I was in a, um, a graduate uh, uh, acting program. I was uh, doing my uh, uh, MFA acting and directing studies at uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, which means that as a Sherlockian, I had uh, made contact with the occupants of the empty house in hmm. uh, right. Southern Illinois. So which really meant that I, I was already kind of under the tutelage of uh, Bill Cochran, BSI, and uh, the late Gordon Speck, BSI. And they uh, came out to see me in a production of, playing Sherlock Holmes, in a production of uh, The Incredible Murder of Cardinal Tosca. And, uh, which is a, which is a great fun show. What a, what a, just a galloping, you know, melodrama that is. And, uh, they were so supportive. They were so, they were so encouraging. And, uh, I don't remember which of them, or maybe they both said, they said, so you're a playwright. You should probably write a Sherlockian play. And I said, that's interesting because people around here are telling me that the smart thing for actors to do these days is to not go out into the acting world hoping to find a job, but to make their own job, but to create the show that is going to be the vehicle for them. And, um, you know, th th this is 30 years ago, but I, but, um, you know, right now the most successful show, uh, you know, theatrical show in America is something that Len Manuel Miranda created so he could star in it. So it just proves that they were right, but that's, uh, but a lot of people have done that. They've created these projects for themselves. Oh, the Wee and Gillette did that, right? Absolutely. So, um, so I thought, well, you know, if it worked for William Jones, and he could, and he played Sherlock Holmes for, you know, 120 years or however long he did it. Um, so I wrote a one man show called uh, Sherlock Holmes, the greatest man who never lived, which I guess is kind of a spoiler in the title, <laughs> but, uh, it, it was, it was, I, it, so, and I performed it exactly once. It was me on stage as Sherlock Holmes coming back to Baker street um, from the, the great hiatus and, um, just sort of reviewing how I came to that place and won't Watson be surprised tomorrow when I reveal myself to him and, uh, people, the few people who saw that the one time I did it, they, they all liked it, but without, you know, across the board, they all said, you're overlooking the obvious. This play needs to have Watson in it. And, um, I said, well, that's exactly right. Um, cause really the play, it, it was Holmes talking about how important Watson is to him. And, um, so I went back and looked at it again and really thought seriously about that post Reichenbach, you know, about empty house hmm. and tried to think, what if this really happened? C because thanks to the occupants in the empty house, I had been introduced to, to the great game. And to understanding that uh, not everything that Watson tells us is true, <laughs> which is a revelation in itself, right? And I thought, what, what if, what if what he tells us in Empty House is not exactly how it happened? So I read Empty House again and thought, what, what if, what if these events are really happening the way he describes that, that moment where Holmes shows back up again and says, ha ha, I fooled you for three years. You thought I was dead. And I thought, I think if I were Watson, I would punch him in the mouth. <laughs> well, and that, that's exactly what happened in the BBC version, isn't it? Yes. I, that, that, that pleased me so much. Yes. I just said, yes, thank you. I've always wanted to see it played like that. And, <laughs> and while the, and while the, the, uh, the physical blow doesn't happen in Holmes and Watson, it is, it is a long night where the two of them have to hash out how cruelly Watson's been treated and Holmes's own problem with articulating his own feelings, which are that the reason why he came back was for Watson, hmm. but he can't say that he can't say it. Um, which, which makes it sound like it's a, um, a sort of a, a handkerchief ringing, uh, emotional drama. But, um, I, I knew that the, I, I don't think anybody would want to sit still for two hours of that. So there is also a murder mystery, hmm. which they solve in the course of their 
Um, well, they can't leave because Colonel Moran is out there waiting to shoot whoever shows his face first. Right. So it, it's, it's the classic setup for this. This is now in my playwriting classes. I do this now as an elementary exercise, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, because this is so fundamental to playwriting. Get two people who can't stand each other and then lock them in the same room together. So, um, so that's really all that Holmes and Watson is. It's, the, it's just literally Holmes and Watson and nobody else. And it's the two of them. And they, they have this problem to work out and, um, they can't leave. So, uh, so that's it. And, um, and I was pushing the script around and then, and, uh, they, they picked it up at my, my alma mater in 1989, as you, as you pointed out. And, um, my great friend Jack Cannon, um, played the Sherlock Holmes was the original Sherlock Holmes in that. And a young man named Alan Gardner was Watson. And I, I maintain to this day, Alan is, is my favorite stage Watson. Um, and, um, why, why is that? He, uh, boy, <laughs> yeah, I could write a book. Um, and, and I get very emotional because, uh, Alan, um, just a few years ago, he, as, as still a young man, he contracted this weird and aggressive cancer and it, and it killed him. Oh. And, um, uh, but, but he, um, he was the first Watson I ever saw in Holmes and Watson. He's the Watson I took to New York with me. And so he and I were Holmes and Watson off Broadway. Years later, we revived the show and he and I were Holmes and Watson again. And, uh, I just, um, he just embodied all those qualities that I always thought were, were Watsonian. He's, um, he's, he's sort of beleaguered because he's smarter than people think he is. And it's, um, that's, this is the way he plays his Watson. He, he, you could always sense him struggling with the fact that he adores his life with Sherlock Holmes, but Sherlock Holmes also drives him crazy <laughs> and that he dislikes being the feeling of being, uh, you know, the, the second smartest person in the room. And, and, um, and that he's in, that he's all heart that he, that he is always going to respond emotionally first. And, uh, that he finds it irritating that Holmes's response is always going to be, uh, intellectual it's always mm -hmm. going to be uh he's going, he's going to work with the brain and and he's the one who knows that the synthesis of the two is where the solution is going to be and Holmes may pay lip service to that but watson is the one who knows it has experienced it and felt it um, my wife and i were talking about just this this just the other night i i should have called the play from the beginning watson and holmes mm -hmm. because i really think that's i think that's what it is well, it's, you know, I think it's interesting because in the, um, well, I, I don't suppose it's a preface, but it's a note, uh, before the beginning of the play. Uh, it says, in the spring of 1891, the great detective Sherlock Holmes and his nemesis, Professor Moriarty, battled to the death atop the towering peaks of the Reichenbach Falls in Switzerland. Each man was intent on the destruction of the other. Both were successful. So following that, you know, you've really got this, you know, back to basics for Holmes and Watson, where they they have an opportunity to really explore what they mean to each other and and how they've come to interact over the years and, and literally how uh, they've they've saved one another's lives. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to me, that's that was the story worth telling and that somehow. In, in, in the canonical telling of it, Watson sort of leaves that part out. Hmm. Now, why do and, you suppose and, that is? <laughs> well, that's it. I thought there must be a secret that he's hiding. And, and the secret is that there was this blazing row between the two of them in the middle of the night and that they had this, this kind of what, what I think to, to Watson as a Victorian gentleman, hmm. what to him would be, uh, a, an embarrassing, um, set of displays of emotion. And he's not going to tell that story. He's not going to tell that how it really happened. And yet so we, the version we that he makes up is what we get in Empty House. Yeah. Yeah. And yet we have glimpses in the canon of smaller rows between the two of them. So. Well, and this was the guidance that I was getting from, from uh, Gordon and from Bill that was so valuable at the time because they, as much more experienced uh, Sherlockians, you know, as, as, as BSI and professional players of the game, they were saying that the challenge for people writing pastiche, which is, you know, which is what this is, 
it, it is to is to bend is to pull on the canonical fabric, but not pull so hard that you tear it. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, that that was that was that was great guidance. And I had some things happen, and I would show drafts of this to Gordon. He would say, "I think I can sense the fabric starting to rip." <laughs> You know, and I would back up and I, and, and, and I, I always said that I think the result is that there's nothing that happens in the play that you, you, you can't say they, they wouldn't do that because I, I'm pretty sure that anything that seems extraordinary for them, I can point you towards something that happens in one of the 60 stories and say, yeah, but it happened here. He, he said that here. Right. Or, you know, the, I think, but. Like I say, I was, I was still very young and, uh, and uh, kind of an amateur Sherlockian. So that was my, that was my best effort, uh, at the time. But, um, I, I one of my favorite uh, stories to tell about that has a, has a dirty word in it. Can I, can I say it? Are you going to bleep it? Or? Yeah. We can, we can make this work. I, I think our, work. our listeners will be intrigued. Okay. Yeah. Well, the they'll, they'll, context is easy, but, um, at, I was invited to the BSI dinner in 1990. We were off Broadway in 1990. Mm-hmm. And I was at the dinner in 1991. And at one of the breaks where everybody runs out to, to pee, I was standing at the urinal with two members of the Baker Street Irregulars. And one of them said to the other, did you see that that play that was here uh, last year, that, uh, that Holmes and Watson thing? And, of course, one of my ears got to three sizes bigger. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> this is great. I just happened to be here for this conversation. <laughs> and he, and he said, uh, cause I thought that was pretty good. You know, I'd like to see that again. And the other guy said, nah, I don't go for that. Sherlock Holmes meets Tennessee Williams. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was possibly <laughs> the greatest compliment you could have received. I, <laughs> I chose to take it that way, but, but I did come away thinking, is that, is that a, a fair assessment of it? Eh, well, kind of, maybe. Oh, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, there are a lot of people who encounter these beloved, these characters and they become beloved. And one way to interpret that remark is that this particular person is just not comfortable with seeing them impersonated live by actors in new situations, you know, outside of the story, outside of the ability to sort of recreate Victorian London and and watch everything through Watson's eyes. You know, some people, you know, they um you know, they prefer Superman in the comic books and not in the movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think that's a I think that's a legitimate reading too that I I the fact that he was being sort of dismissive about it told me that he, he there may not be a lot of Sherlock Holmes plays that he likes. <laughs> You know, or, um, or any, yeah, yeah, or any, that's right. Any, any theater that he likes, because, because the play does sort of ask, why are they acting this way? And if, and if you're not comfortable with that question, then yeah, you're not going to like this play. But the, the, the really amazing thing to me as the years have gone by is how many of my gay and lesbian friends have read the play or seen a production of it and, and congratulated me on the, um, the deafness with which I've articulated these two men who, who love each other. And I mean, love, love each other, but are not permitted in their society, in their society to say so, hmm. which was not really my intent. But isn't that interesting though? Yeah. That what they saw was a real a romantic love story, a, a love that, that, uh, as, uh, uh, that Oscar, as Oscar Wilde said, the, the dare not speak its name. Um, and uh, as a straight guy with terrible gaydar, I, 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 I would never presume to try to write a play about two gay men who can't, who, who can't express it, but apparently I've done it anyway. Um, <laughs> for, or at least it's perceived that way by many people in, in the audience and, and they're, and they're, they're pleased with it. They're happy about it. So well, I, I, I oh. think what you've, what you've captured, and this is, you know, something we've remarked on a number of times before is uh, part of the universality of the canon itself that, you know, it's a textbook of friendship. And what is friendship but a form of true love? You yeah. know, if you're doing things selflessly and because you care about another person, you know, uh, whether it's a romantic love, a friend-based love, you know, it, it's a universal thing that transcends 
uh, you know, all genders. So, you know, I think what, what you've done is strike at the, at the universal human truth. Well, I hope so. You, cause the, that your, your reading of that makes, makes sense to me. And I can understand why straight people would see them as straight and gay people might see them as gay. And sure. because, uh, because it's a, it's a universality. Yeah. yeah. You don't, you don't have to have sex with people to love them. So, right. So, um, sometimes yeah. that ruins it. <laughs> and, uh, indeed. Sometimes you better not. Yeah. Uh. Um, I will tell you that, that there is, um, the setup of, of the Baker Street set, the way it has usually been executed by, by my great friend, Kel Lager, who is a devoted Sherlockian. And so it, it's always his dream to get to do this show because he gets to build the sitting room at Baker Street and appoint it with everything. But, um, he had the entrances to our bedrooms side by side. So there's none of this one's upstairs and one's downstairs thing. Okay. But because it's all on, you know, on one stage. So there's the entrance stage left that goes to the hall, to the, goes to the stairs. And then on the, on the other side of the stage, these two doors, one goes to Holmes's bedroom, one goes to Watson's. And one night in the, when, when uh, Alan and I did the revival in the year 2000, he did this scene where he, he, he tells me off. He has this big speech as Watson, you know, I, I've had it with you because you do this and this and this and this. And he's supposed to flounce off to his bedroom and slam the door. And I don't know how he got turned around that night, but he went off into my bedroom and slammed the door. <laughs> that has, that has a whole new twist to the plot. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I remember just sort of standing on the stage think, and listening keenly to the audience. There's no little titter out there in the audience. I thought, okay, they don't really know which of these doors is which. We're the only ones who know. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I just ended the scene by going off into the other room, but, um, yeah, that, that is a moment I'll never forget because I thought, well, has he just made the moment, made the decision at this moment? To, <laughs> and here's how we're going to sort it out. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you in just a minute. While the Baker Street Journal is a nominal sponsor of the show, a visit to the site BakerStreetIrregulars.com will quickly show that, well, there's more available there than just the journal. You know, it's the home of the Baker Street Irregulars Press, where you can buy books with the best of the best, scholarship from the ages, curated and edited into volumes that are ready for your bookshelves. One of the best-selling books of the BSI Press Pantheon is The Grand Game, a celebration of Sherlockian scholarship, Volume 1, 1902 to 1959. This ambitious project was undertaken and edited by Lori R. King and Leslie S. Klinger and was originally published in 2011. It features some of the greatest early scholarship in the Sherlockian world, from pamphlets and scarce small prints to some of the first articles in the Baker Street Journal. The book has been long out of print, but we have news for listeners of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. The BSI Press has reissued the Grand Game Volume 1 as a trade paperback. The late Bernard Davies once wrote, How wonderful to discover that even if you're slightly mad, you're not alone. And this book demonstrates well just how interesting it can be to play the grand game. So pop over to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and get your copy today. You were talking yeah. earlier about 7% Solution. I'm curious, are there any other Sherlock Holmes plays that you've seen and admired? Have you ever seen a staging of the original Gillette play or any of the other plays that have been done over the years? I have seen a, a great production of, um, the, of Sherlock Holmes or the strange case of Alice Faulkner. And, uh, and boy, when it's done right, what a, what a show that is. Um, <laughs> that last emotional beat does, does kind of make you go, what? But that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, makes you wonder how that uh, BSI at the urinal might have responded to William. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I think I know what he would have said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, and, um, uh, uh, Sherlock's last case I saw with Frank Langella, um, as, as Sherlock Holmes. Um, in fact, here's a funny story about that. I, I, I guess since uh, so many of the people involved in this are, are dead now, I can tell this story. God, I'm old. Um, but, um, when I went to New York uh, as a young man to seek my fortune, I did this, this thing that I, I think that I would have told anybody else is, is foolhardy, but I had a little satchel that I carried my, um, 
all of my finished stage and screenplays around it. I had this big bag of scripts that I was carrying around with me pretty much everywhere with the idea that sooner or later I'll run into somebody who will want to read them and I'll need to press it into their hands. I think I had the idea that the streets of New York were just surging with celebrities going up and down the sidewalk constantly. The yeah. streets of New York are paved with producers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I just needed to step onto the right one. And uh, yeah, but I did have lunch with a producer who was a friend of a friend of a friend. And, and um, yeah, so this is somebody I knew kind of sort of, and um, he had been working um, with the special effects on uh, secret of Sherlock Holmes. no, it's Sherlock's last case, right? I'm getting them mixed up. Secret of Sherlock Holmes is the one that Jeremy Brett and uh, right. Edward Hardwick were doing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Frank Langellis was Sherlock's last case, right? He, he had been working with the effects team on Sherlock's last case. And according to him anyway, Frank Langella came in in some kind of a, an artistic fit and decided that he didn't like the way things were going and fired everybody, and including my producer friends, uh, clients. And so he was mad about that. And while we were eating lunch, he was telling me about all this and he was saying, you know, and it's too bad because I really, I really want to be involved in a Sherlock Holmes play, you know, by God, if I had a Sherlock Holmes script, I'd do it right now. <laughs> Pardon me while yeah. I reach into my satchel. Exactly. And ladies and gentlemen, yes, just to show you that that stupid kind of, yeah. Hollywood moment actually does happen because I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> Funny and he did, he, he took Holmes and Watson home and read it that night. And he said, let's do this. That's so, great. and he, and he knew that I had written it for myself. So I've always felt bad about this because the original, it had already been done at UAB at that time with, with Jack and Alan. But he said, I know that you want to do this. So, you, you know, let's just say that's done. You know, you're going to play Sherlock Holmes, pick your Watson. And I said, nobody, but Alan. Yeah. So that's how, that's how Alan and I came to doing it off Broadway. Now, and, and what an adventure that was. So yeah. Yeah. And I want to, I want to delve a little bit into uh, some of the, the stagecraft here because in the appendix of the version of Holmes and Watson <laughs> uh, that we have, uh, you have um, a section called overcoming the technical challenges of Holmes and Watson. Yes. What what were those technical challenges? <laughs> oh, what a great interview. You're asking all the questions I always wish people would ask me about this. <laughs> you just see you just have to know I, which show to go on, Lee. I did not I did not set him up with this people. I did not. I did not give give Scott a list of please ask me about this. Um this just shows how young as a playwright I was. I really thought I knew that there was a trend towards simplification. On, 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 you know, stages everywhere that theater doesn't have the millions behind it everywhere that it used to have. Um, in all cases, I mean, I'm probably right now, everything it's a, if it's not a musical or Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, then, then forget it. You know, there, there are no straight plays. So you, you, if, if you're writing a straight play, you've got to think about, um, how our theater is going to do it. And I said, this play is going to be perfect because there's only one set and two actors. It's brilliant. Right. <laughs> and in the 30 years since I've heard again and again and again from people who have looked at the script and considered producing it. So we love the script. It really is a lot of fun. It, 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 it has such challenging things going on, but there's two big problems. These two guys are on stage the whole time. It's a, it's a marathon performance for these two guys. We're not sure we can cast it. Also, this one room that they're in has to do tricks. It's got things that blow up and catch fire and fall down and, and you know, they, you just, we just can't do it. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm a hoist on my own petard that, yeah, it's only one set and two people, but holy smoke, what a set and what it demands of those two people. And I remember, you know, the times that I've, I've been in the show myself as Holmes, there's about two thirds of the way through the show where I really start getting exhausted and I keep thinking, who the hell wrote this thing? <laughs> Whose idea was this? It is. It's just really, it's just really hard. As anybody who's, who's done the play will tell you, it's, it's just really hard. Um, hmm. but the, the, there is, there's a moment. I don't want to get too spoilerific, but Holmes shoots something off the mantelpiece. He puts something on the mantelpiece, walks across the room, takes Watson's service revolver, aims at the mantelpiece, blam, shoots the thing, and it's a, it's a big story point. 
my idea was that we were going to use a real gun with real bullets. Oh, boy. Oh, gee. <laughs> and I didn't have anybody in the theater world to uh, sort of take me along and say, well, no, you're not. That's that's not how you do things on the stage. That's how I would have done it. <laughs> and, of course, whoever was standing on the other side of that wall, you know, might have had something to say about it, too. But... uh Everyone Only briefly, actually. Just, <laughs> we can certainly, we lose more stage managers that way. Yeah. So, so if you're not going to shoot it with a real bullet, what do you do? And what we came up with for, well, they did this at UAB as well, but yeah, in the off-Broadway production, there was, there's a squib. We had a, an electrically triggered explosive charge that was built into the mantelpiece. Mm -hmm. So then the things that get shot at that moment, Holmes goes over and he puts this thing down on top of the squib, walks back across the room and pulls the trigger of the gun. Now the stage manager off stage is going to fire that squib off at the precise moment that the gun fires, creating the illusion that the fired gun is what caused this thing to right. blow up the way it did. You just have to it hope sounds... the stage manager hasn't fallen asleep backstage. Exactly. <laughs> and... <laughs> And is also telepathic because well, yeah, it, it it that all sounds wonderful and it looks fine on paper, but the odds of actually getting those two things to go off at the same time is pretty slim. Yeah. So night after night in UAB, we would get laughter from the audience because the squib would go off before the gun did, <laughs> which makes it look like Holmes has shattered this thing with the power of his mind. Um. Or the gun goes off and the squib doesn't, which that actually happened more often than not. And, and Jack, uh, Jack Cannon, our, our first Holmes, I always loved this, that the, every, when nights when that would happen, he would just say, well, I never was a very good shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's and they just walk over and hit the thing with the butt of the gun, which, <laughs> uh, which, which worked just as well. You know. But, uh, but we did, we tried all different kinds of ways to make this work. And I, and I still haven't really figured out what the best way to do it is. It just, it was just naivete on my part of, mm. of writing the. Well, uh, these days you could use Bluetooth. Bluetooth. I, I really do. I, I really do think there is a way to have a, a gun, something that looks like, that looks like Watson service revolver. It right. would be a trigger for the squib. Yeah. No, that really, that is, that is how I, I think it should be done. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but uh, I've never been involved with a production that had that kind of uh, kind of capability. Hmm. But, um, yeah, so but I take a, it Holmes is Holmes is not speaking when he's shooting the gun. He is. He he says this is my resolution for the year to come. And so what I always did was I said that this is my resolution for the year to come. Bang. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, you know, yeah. So that the stage manager knew that's the cadence for the year to come. Bang. Yeah. Anyway. Well, um, brave work. work. <laughs> we, yeah, I, I think we, we said, um, in New York that we were getting it like six times out of 10. So <laughs> it's got to be pretty good. The, the, all these things that blew up also had to be, uh, replaced every night. And our stage manager, um, the, the, the great designer, uh, Kel Lager again, Kel, uh, had found a formula for making, um, sugar glass. And so we would, we would melt the glass every night. There's a window pane that gets shot out also. And so that had to be replaced every night. And, um, it, it creates a lot of smoke making this process. And we learned that if you do this in the stairwell at City Court Plaza, which is where the theater at St. Peter's is, if you send up a column of smoke up the stairwell at St. Peter's, um, you will get three of New York's finest hook and ladder trucks. <laughs> Well, and all of the guys coming in asking you what the heck is going on. And yeah, they probably want tickets, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they wanted our hide. Yeah. I'm just glad they didn't bill us for it. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't handling the money end of things. Maybe they did. Maybe we got fined for that. I don't know. But, uh, but the, we, we had, uh, there were so many things that we were naive about. Uh, we had, we, we went to great extent. Uh, great lengths and great expense, uh, to make sure that the two handguns in the show are a period. And Watson's gun was a Afghan war issue Webley service revolver with a beautiful, beautiful thing. 
And I was so proud of that because I knew one of the reasons we were doing the show in January, which is traditionally a terrible time to try to do theater in New York, was because we knew the, the BSI dinner and the, and Ash and everybody, they were all going to be there. So, uh, which is great. On the other hand, it also means that our toughest critics are going to be there. And I really wanted that moment when Watson pulls that gun out for all those people in the audience to go, Hey, that's, that's Watson's gun. That's well done. What I didn't know was that when you do a show off Broadway like that, that has handguns in it, the police come uh, to dress rehearsal and to, to inspect and make sure everything's okay. Um, that seems obvious to me now looking back, but I, I didn't know that. So they looked over our guns and they said, are you kidding me? No, no, you're not going to fire these guns on this stage. So the night before opening night or the day that we were going to open, we are scouring New York city, which fortunately is a theater town, right? To try to find uh stage worthy legal dummy guns that would look something like what we use. So in the end we had basically a track pistol, which, uh, you know, didn't look anything like Watson's uh, service revolver. I knew but a guy down kept... on the Bowery that sold those out of the back of his white van. Um, <laughs> could have saved you a little trouble there. <laughs> <laughs> and he's still there. <laughs> yeah. Painting the tip so, orange. Yeah. yeah. So, so what else? I mean, you speak so warmly and knowledgeably about these characters and you have such interesting perspective on their relationship and you've brought them to the stage. Have you, I mean, I know you're, you've also done some cartooning regularly in the Baker street journal about Holmes and Watson, but uh, what else have you done with these characters? Are there, are there more plays? Have you thought about short stories? Have you, do you, do you think about them? Do you, do you still think about them for, you know, bringing them around in various forms, radio, other things. I guess they're never very far from my mind, right? That, that you, you, you guys and I, we, we, we think about them in some, some way all the time. I, um, the, um, my radio drama serial of relativity is not Sherlockian in nature. Although of course we name check Sherlock Holmes every now and then, even though it takes place a hundred years in the future, because people are still going to be talking about Sherlock Holmes a hundred years from now. Right. But, but it is sort of a, a conflict between two people who have um, those essential qualities. One is mostly heart and the other one is mostly brain. And um, they tend to, you know, uh, uh, get into conflict about how to resolve a, a particular problem because one says, no, we, you know, we need to take care of the people involved. And says, well, no, we need to take care of the things involved, you know, think it. And the other one's saying, no, feel it. Um, and for a change, I'm playing the one who's always, you know, leaping into things and, you know, and not thinking it, thinking it through. Um, so, so that, that, uh, heart versus head thing is always in my mind. And, it, and it's one of the things that, that, that I know. I, I, is what I love about the original Star Trek series. It, it's, it's Kirk and Spock. Um, and that very often the solution to the problem of the week is not entirely what Spock says and not entirely what Kirk says. It's the two of them kind of working things out together, finding a place in between. Or very often Kirk ends up being the arbiter between the purely uh, logical Spock and the, um, the, uh, the, the hot button McCoy. So sometimes Kirk is sort of, you know, in the middle saying, okay, I think you're both right. We're going to, we're going to find a way, you know, to make this work. Um, and, um, uh, but I, in this day and age, I really wanted to, to figure out how to, how to do all of that with two women. Um, and, uh, so I wrote a TV pilot that I called Herlock. Um, <laughs> and one of the people who uh, I was on social media saying, okay, we're, we're launching this project now. We're going to call it Herlock. And um, one of my friends, his immediate response was, so is this porn or what? Um, wow. I, <laughs> so was it? Why, just, just get, no, <laughs> 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 we would have made more money. <laughs> um, no, I, and, and I was, you know, I, I was crushed because I thought, oh no, I hope I haven't, I hope I haven't done it again. I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I'm always uh, choosing, uh, choosing names for things poorly, you know. 
I mean, looking back, calling Holmes and Watson Holmes and Watson was it was a huge mistake because there's no way I I can't own that. There's no way I could copyright that. Mm. Um, and now Jeffrey Hatcher's play that's now been out for a while and is is now the Sherlock Holmes play that I feel like most people are talking about. It's called Holmes and Watson. Um, he has no obligation to say, Hey, somebody already used that title. There's, there's, there's a pastiche called Holmes and Watson. I think there was an earlier, a yet earlier play called Holmes and Watson that I haven't read. And now we have a film coming out that's called Holmes and Watson, um, which isn't based on my play or Jeffrey Hatcher's, but is apparently, you know, it's just going to be a more, um, um, uh, what's, what's the, the Michael Caine movie? Um, without a clue, without a clue. Without a clue. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's going to be a lot more like without a clue. Um, well, if it so, if it makes you feel any better, they're already talking about the uh, film in BSI bathrooms everywhere. So. <laughs> exactly. I don't go for that. Will Ferrell meets Sherlock Holmes. Um, yeah. Well, I, but but you you see what I mean that if people are looking for for my play and I'm and Jeffrey Hatcher has this problem too, I imagine. But you Google the words Holmes and Watson. You know, it may be a while before they get down to your script. Yeah. Um, and I did it again with the radio drama of calling it relativity that, and, uh, and Herlock, I didn't even think about this, but that's, that's unsearchable. If you search for Herlock, Google will immediately spell, will immediately autocorrect you to Sherlock. Oh, interesting. Huh? So, well, and, and if you, and if you say, no, I mean, Herlock, it will take you to the Japanese, to the anime series, Captain Harlock. Oh my gosh. So it, it's just been very hard for people to find Herlock, but we did, we did produce that. My, my, my bestest buddy, uh, David Duncan directed it. And, um, it's, uh, the web is the, the, the one episode that we did is still out there and, uh, it's on the website, herlock.us. So I tell people just go straight to it. Well, if it makes uh, you feel any better, that is the top search result when you put Herlock into Google now. Get out of town. Yeah. Yeah. It shows you how long it's been since I tried that. Well. And, and, and how long it takes Google to catch on, but they're, they're smart. Here, here's the other thing too. Um, you were once again ahead of the trend because HBO Japan and mm-hmm. they recently partnered with Hulu to bring it to the United States, uh, produced Miss Sherlock. Yes. Which was, uh, I think an eight episode, uh, series, uh, about again, uh, women inhabiting the roles of Holmes and Watson in the modern day. Yeah, and I haven't seen any of that, but of course I'm fascinated by it. But, um, yeah, two things you remind me of. Uh, one is that, uh, I always love my, my wife's, uh, uh, remark about this that she had seen, we'd watched The Great Mouse Detective <laughs> and, uh, we, we watched uh, the Star Trek The Next Generation episodes where Data was playing Sherlock Holmes on the holodeck. And, uh, and she said after seeing those, she said, why can Sherlock Holmes be a mouse and a robot, but can't be a woman? Ha. He said, that's good. Yes. That's really good. And that's, that's, that is the origin point of, of Herlock. And I started saying, there's not a reason in the world. Let's do it. And we premiered it at the convention, uh, 221 Beacon. And we ended up on the roster with two other web series pilots in which Holmes and Watson are women. Oh my goodness. Two. Yes. There were three. So, which, you know, in one way was sort of heartbreaking. We said, well, now we're all just going to get in each other's way. Um, but on the other hand, this certainly demonstrates that it was the right time, wasn't it? Right. Um, and, and, um, and, and at this time, you know, Watson was already a woman on uh, elementary, which I had not been watching. So I didn't, I mean, I, I knew about it, but I, I hadn't been watching it. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm still, I'm still proud of her. Like I still, um, I wanted to do the thing that um, um, Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss were doing um, to begin with on uh, BBC Sherlock to to touch on canonical stories, but to not make the, the, the canonical story essential to people's understanding of the episode, you know, mm-hmm. to not literally do, you know, I mean, because the first one is sort of study in Scarlet, kind of, sort of. And so um, mm-hmm. mine is kind of Silver Blaze, kind mm-hmm. of, but it's got cars. And I don't know. It's a, uh, uh, I'd, I'd be interested if, if people listening to this, uh, go watch Herlock and if they feed back to you what they think about it. Yeah. Uh, we've heard, we've heard from people literally all over the world 
who love it, but really not from a lot of Sherlockians. We showed a, the pilot at uh, Scintillation of Scions a couple of years ago, and um, Chris Redman was um, live tweeting during all that, mm-hmm. and he 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 described it as being vaguely Sherlockian, <laughs> which kind of made me come away saying, "No, look, it's it's Silver Blaze. It's it, it's it's yeah." Yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah, yeah, it is. It's vaguely Sherlock. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, maybe we did sort of get off the Sherlock path somewhere in the making of it, but anyway. Um, well, hey, but yeah, you're you're not alone. Conan Doyle got off the path later in, well, in his years. <laughs> exactly, <years, so. laughs> exactly. So yeah, but that wasn't because I was sick of the character. So right. Anyway, now I mentioned. Um, Star Trek Next Generation, I, I, sh- I should tell you that one of the, uh, the other weird aspects of this whole story was that after playing Sherlock Holmes off Broadway and Holmes and Watson, which, you know, was certainly to me at, I was 29 then. Yeah. Which was a, a career high. I thought maybe this is going to be it. I came back home to Birmingham and, uh, there were messages on my answering machine. And one of them was from my agent asking me if I would like to go pitch for Star Trek Next Generation. Would I like to go pitch for Star Trek Next hmm. Generation? Let me check. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of busy, but, uh, yeah. So that was amazing. And, um, one of the first things I wanted to do was to, was to propose another story that would deal with, uh, uh, data in the holodeck playing Sherlock Holmes. Of course. Um, elementary dear data had been one of the most popular episodes of the season before this. Right. Uh, for people who know next generation. And I pitched my story, which would have involved getting Moriarty out of the holodeck and bringing him to life in three dimensions uh, and taking over the ship. And um, in the writer's room there, they said, no, we can't do that. The uh, the estate won't allow us to use the characters anymore. Yeah. And I said, what? Yeah. I don't I don't think that's right. And you know, this is, this is amazing. Do you remember the, 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 the magazine Starlog? I yeah, know. Sure. I, um, uh, I, I had them all, man. Somebody at Starlog had written an article in which they said that the Conan Doyle estate was, was uh, upset with the treatment of the character with the Commander Data playing him. And so they, they wouldn't allow them to use the character again. I don't know where they got that, but here's the amazing thing. People at Star Trek read that article and believed it. Wow. Wow. Which that's, it, that's a power of media story, I guess. But anyway, I, so I, I left that pitch meeting saying, let me just talk to John Lillenberg BSI, who is somebody I happen to know right. and is the executor of the estate for heaven's sake. And so I reached out to John. He said, no, that's ridiculous. That's no, no, we, we love seeing Sherlock Holmes on Star Trek. So he got in touch with the, the head of Paramount Legal and then, you know, Just like that, the door was open again. Well, what he meant is nothing's ridiculous for the right check. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) And and I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about, uh, you know, what, 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 what changed hands after that. But, but, um, but yeah. Um, but so I went back, you know, kind of rubbing my hands with glee. I said, okay, who wants to hear my pitch now? Right. Now that I've opened the door back for you. And, um, yeah, so my pitch became what would ultimately be the episode called Ship in a Bottle. And um it, the I guess it's a good news, bad news thing. It means that I, I got to live the fantasy that I'd had ever since I was a kid of being um present at the creation of an episode of Star Trek. Um because the original series ended when I was seven years old. So, you know, obviously I, I missed that one. The next generation gave me an opportunity to do that. Yeah. But um, the way TV works, especially for freelancers, is that if, you know, you, you, you may get, um, you may get uh, paid for your story, but that doesn't mean your name is going to be on it because every hand that it passes through, it changes a little more and a little more and a little more. And the Writers Guild says that the script belongs to whoever literally wrote the most words ah. of the script. So, and they do, they count the words from each draft and compare them. And um, the story editor for that season, Rene Echevarria, he his version is the one that, you know, is is aired and um, and he gets sole story credit, he gets sole uh, credit for it, um, which is okay, I guess. I would have loved to have seen my name in that opening title, but uh, but I still know that was my story. Was it was it recognizable to you in the end? 
Um, I had a different ending. And so most of what they changed was in Acts, Acts three and four of the script. And I have to admit their ending, Renee's ending is much better than what I had in mind. Um, but, but Sherlockians will appreciate this. I really wanted data to talk Moriarty into going back into the holodeck and where they went to is Reichenbach Falls. <laughs> and. I, and I had figured out some way that that what Moriarty wouldn't know what was going to happen. I don't really remember what the mechanism was there. But Jordy, of course, as Watson, is outside of all this, realizing this means that they're both going to die. Mm. The, the data has, is going to commit suicide for the sake of getting rid of, of Moriarty. But the holodeck has already been pre-programmed to also to not only do Final Problem, but to also do Empty House. And that was how they were going to get out of it. <laughs> and I remember that people in the, in the, in the, the writer's room there said, yeah, that's cute. That is cute. And, and I agree. Yeah. That's the problem with that. That's cute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if it was a show that was known for being cute, <laughs> that yeah. might have been okay. Yeah. We, we might do it on the Orville. Anyway, uh, but, uh, but not on next generation. So got it. But, uh, but no, it, it, it's, it's, I think it's brilliant, really, that in, uh, in Ship in a Bottle, as, uh, as it was ultimately written, um, Moriarty doesn't know that he's not out <laughs> in command and, and has taken over the world, you know, right, and he, right. he's, he's content to live that. It's, it's, it's really beautiful. But, but yeah, so there was this time period there where I was playing Sherlock Holmes and then just within a matter of months, I was pitching Sherlock Holmes stories to, to, uh, cable television. And, um, yeah, and then since then I've been drawing Sherlockian cartoons and writing Sherlock Holmes web series and all kinds of things like that. It's just, yeah. it never ends. It never ends. Well, oh, I mean, and getting to see productions of Holmes and Watson here and there, which is, you know, that's just never ending fun. I, I, I will always, I'm always willing to travel somewhere to see a production of Holmes and Watson. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you that. I mean, how, how often is the play performed these days? It's, uh, it's a little hard for me to tell because uh, I self-published the script, and so I manage the rights. So every now and then somebody will uh, contact me about performance rights. A lot of times people do it without contacting me for performance rights. Uh-oh. So uh, I'm I'm always intrigued when somebody says, oh, you're the guy who wrote Holmes and Watson. I saw that in uh. Nebraska one time. Really? Did you indeed? Come so. on! Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's happened with a number of things that I've written. But, and you know, there's, there's not much you can do about it, really. Yeah. I guess I'm just glad they're, they're doing the play, but, um, cause, cause nobody's getting rich off of this. Uh, wow. Um, it's, um, what, what intrigues me though is that, um, I have seen a number of people do it, um, on basically a bare set to do it with just a few set pieces. Huh. And since, since the technical demands are so, high for the play that really interests me. So I'll see production photos. You know, if it's a production that I can't get to, people will send me photos and I, and I just look at the picture and go, wow, I wish I'd seen that. <laughs> uh, because I, I really would like to have known how they, how they did that. Uh, -huh. uh but, um, I don't know, but, but my wife asked me just last night, why haven't you written any other Sherlock Holmes plays? And I said, well, you know, because, um, huh, <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I, I think because not long after that, I was the head writer on a radio drama serial for three years, uh, for more than three years, and then uh, started writing. Yeah, I, don't know, I, I, I just, I've been busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, understandable. Just, yeah. But, uh, uh, well, if people would like to get a copy of the play Holmes and Watson, it is available through Amazon. We will uh, have a link to. Uh, purchase that on the show notes. Bless um, your heart. And, uh, I, I, I just want to pause on one last thing that, um, in your own remarks about the play, I wish we had mentioned this earlier. Uh, you said you've often thought that the play's subtitle should be alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great way to sum it up. That was a, that was a sort of a pre 9 11 joke, but yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and actually, I did make a poster when we did the the uh, 
um, the revival in 2010 that, uh, I mean, in the year 2000 that, uh, that just said alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and had the Holmes and Watson profiles on it. That's, that's great. <laughs> but yep. Yeah, yep. That's pretty much sums it up. I love it. And it's, it's, uh, gotten critical accolades from Jeremy Brett and Isaac Asimov. I mean, you couldn't be in better company. Uh, no. so Lee, it's been an absolute delight speaking with you and i'm i'm i have the feeling that we could continue this conversation for three more hours if we really uh-huh. set our minds to it uh, well, let's have a party we'll, we'll get together we that. should do that we, Good. You know, maybe one of these days we'll have an i hear of sherlock everywhere uh guest party where we, we gather mm-hmm. all of our previous guests in a location and and invite them to uh, mm-hmm. to join us irl so to speak yes well thank you lee and uh, best of luck to you in everything that's coming next. Thank you so much. You know, it's interesting. We occasionally encounter people like Lee, but nobody I can remember with his range of interests, you know, people who are just creative on many levels. He's a cartoonist. He's a playwright. He's an academic. He's an actor. He's, uh, it's really remarkable. And it's, and I think the world of Sherlock Holmes has been enriched by people with this panoply of creative skill. Yeah. I mean, he is, uh, he's like our very own George Plimpton. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing as far as Lee's concerned. Uh, for, for those of you who'd like the cultural reference, uh, George Plimpton, man of letters, uh, writer, uh, academic, actor, um, really a modern day renaissance man. And, uh, I think that fits Lee in quite a number of ways. Well, I think Lee would welcome some of the acting opportunities that came to Plimpton in his <laughs> later years. I remember in the, um, in Tim Hutton's Nero Wolf series, uh, Plimpton had a number of parts as different characters. Yeah, that's a lot oh, of fun. I didn't realize that. That's, that's something. He's, he is seared into my memory as the spokesman for Pop Secret, unfortunately. <laughs> well, what can I tell you? Well, years ago, I did a print campaign when I was at AT&T, and part of that involved, I didn't get to meet him, but um, somebody from our group, uh, I was responsible for the advertising, and the idea was that uh, we featured him in a in a print ad, sort of as a thought leader. But I don't remember the content anymore. Hmm. Well, you know, before we get to canonical couplets and and our announcement, there we do have another announcement to share. Pretty exciting one, wouldn't you say, Bert? Oh, yes. Very exciting. You know, most of our work, of course, is done pre-recorded. You know, we have recorded actually through a concordance all of the words in the English language, the verbs, the predicates, the subjects, or so on. And then these shows are usually dynamically rendered using one of the uh, banks of BSI supercomputers that happen to be in Shenzhen, China. But we've decided that for the upcoming um, Gillette to Brett, five conference that Hmm. we're so excited about primarily because scott and i rarely get out of our homes um we're going to do an actual live show which means we'll be putting these words together uh, with people watching us in real time i can't wait to find out what we um what we're going to say in fact one of the things we might do is do the live show now and then record it i mean i guess we couldn't (laughs) Well, really, every show we do is live. It's just we don't air it live. So, uh, there, there is that. Y- yeah, this will, this will be different because it'll be a video show. Um, obviously, if you don't want to watch us, you can tune into the stream and go to another screen on your, your phone or your, uh, your, your computer, if you will. But we'll have video there. We'll have a table set up. Um, we're still working on exactly the timing. So stay tuned to our Facebook page. If you want to get more information on it exactly when we are going to broadcast, uh, we're toying with something between Friday evening and Sunday morning. You know, the whole conference is on Saturday. We might be able to pull some people out um, as they come by our table in the dealer's room. But um, and, and we do want to 
we do want to bring you some semblance of what it's like there, what people are saying. Maybe grab some interesting people uh, that we certainly intend to have on the show and do a little bit of a teaser with you there. And, um, you know, just kind of generally make it a little more interactive. We'll give you a chance to ask questions if you type in the comments. And if we can get them to our guests, we'll do our best. And it's going to be a wonderful time. I'm really looking forward to that because while we have our table in the dealer's room, of course, we're going to be stacked there with cassettes of all the great outtake moments from 150 different, uh, I hear of Sherlock everywhere shows, but, um, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. It, it should be a lot of fun. So check it out. It's uh, between October 5th and 7th. Again, if you uh, are a fan of us on Facebook, we will update you there and let you know exactly what our plans are. Fall is in the air. And with the new season comes football, leaves, pumpkin pie, pumpkin spice, everything, and of course, the annual Sebastian McCabe Jeff Cody mystery novel, Death Mask. It's a story of civic controversy and murder in Mac and Jeff's small town of Erin, Ohio, as preservationists and development advocates fight over the future of a historic theater. A key figure in the controversy turns up dead. As Mac says... The plot machinations of Grand Opera seem positively guileless by comparison. The opera comparison is a natural one, for the new Aaron Opera Company is staging an original work with a Mardi Gras theme. Murder strikes again, this time backstage, and Mac becomes aware that many of the actors in this real-life drama are wearing metaphorical masks as well. Linda Teal, Jeff's wife, records much of Max sleuthing for a podcast series, never imagining that the most dramatic audio of the concluding episode will come from the murderer. Buy Death Mask online or stop by and see Dan in person in the dealer's room at the Gillette to Brett 5 conference on October 6th in Bloomington, Indiana. He'll be there with us. And of course, you've heard Dan before here on episode 141 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, of course, it is time for the thought leaders that like to participate in canonical couplets. That's right, it is canonical couplet time, and that means that we reach into our barrel and pull out a random name and pull out a random poem. I, I, you know, I, I hesitate to call it poem because it is just a couplet. And as you know, if you've been playing along regularly, we take a stanza, a two-line couplet that is supposed to be a summary of one of the Sherlock Holmes stories from the canon. We read it, and you guess which one it is. And of all of the correct entries, we select one at random to be the official winner that week. And what, what we do is we send out a prize. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a huge prize. Some sort of tchotchke or paper good. Could be a book, could be a pamphlet, something of Sherlockian value. And I mentioned that we had a very special announcement. And it is that, well, I have to say... We have a repeat winner, believe it or not. Unbelievable. I know. What are the odds? Now, we usually don't do this, but let's just say participation was down recently. <laughs> so uh, there is a name that will be coming up here that uh, you may recognize. And let's hope he recognizes it, too, so he can claim his prize. The canonical couplet in episode 151 was as follows. It's hard to find a workable deterrent for kluxers, both historical and current. That word kluxers, we think, may have thrown a few people off. Uh, this individual wrote in for clarification, and he indeed did find out that it is spelled K-L-U-X-E-R. And there was only one canonical story in which the Ku Klux Klan was mentioned. Do you know which one it was, Bert? Sorry, that's the Veiled Squires. <laughs> So close, as always. So close. Uh, it was the five orange pips. It was oh, the five orange pips. Course. Yeah. And, uh, we are pleased to announce that George Fuller won again. So George, congratulations on your prize. And we are so delinquent in sending out 
a previous prize to you that will stuff this one in the same box. So that's uh, save postage. I like that. Well, uh, that means that it must be time for the canonical couplet for episode 152. Just to make sure we don't have anyone miss this one, we'll be pretty clear about it as well. The fundamental tale wins hearty praise from all who overlook its Mormon phase. If you think you know the answer to that, if you can identify the Sherlock Holmes story referenced by that couplet, please send an email to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. The subject line should say canonical couplet, and we will see you at the end of episode 153. Good luck. Superb. I really like that game. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's see if people get their act together this time. Chop, chop, people, you know? Yeah, I think I know the answer to the next one. I didn't realize that Conan Doyle wrote Orphans of the Storm, though. <laughs> hey, no spoilers. Oh, I'm sorry. I may get. I may be getting my reading muddled and, and everything else, too. <laughs> I don't want us getting investigated by Congress like uh, Geritol or uh, 21. Did you ever see the movie Quiz Show? Yes. Yeah, years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was recently talking with someone just last week at a conference. Uh, uh, he was a producer uh, as a young student out of journalism school with PBS. And um, he, he did some work on uh, some documentaries for PBS. And he actually got to know Doris Kearns Goodwin, you know, a major biographer. She She knows many presidents and is well known herself. He didn't really know her, but he was a huge fan of her husband. Uh, her husband was the lead prosecutor in Quiz Show who went after all of the game show people, Robert Goodwin. Oh, really? Yeah. And so, in, I mean, in real life, her husband was the prosecutor? That's right. Huh. And played by, uh, I think, Rob Morrow in, in the movie. So uh, he, he was busy fanboying over Robert Goodwin while he was supposed to be interviewing Doris Kearns Goodwin. <laughs> So our little quiz show trivia this time around. Much more than you needed to know. Well, I think we've just about done enough damage that we can do this time around, unless you can think of something else we should do, Bert. I think we should be moving slowly but surely towards those red exit signs. Oh, please, but don't call me Shirley. Uh, well, until next time rolls around, I am forced to remain Scott Monty. And I'm Shirley Bert Wolder. <laughs> You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck. And believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.